Hi, my name is Denise Aura and I am the Chief Executive of the Royal Botanic Gardens and Domain Trust and the Australian Institute of Botanical Science. And we are here um, for a wonderful, wonderful event to hear from um, Pogendorf Lecture Award winner, Professor Angela Moles. Um, I would like to say that we were on Gadigal country as well, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend in that respect to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders with us today and also to the many lands that you find yourself on. Um, so Professor Angela Moles um, is from the University of New South Wales Evolution and Ecology Research Centre um, and he's going to be talking about a controversial or somewhat controversial topic, are our weeds becoming new native species? Um, I would also like to introduce the wonderful Dr Susan Pond, um, President of the Royal Society of New South South Wales. As well as being president of the Royal Society, Dr. Pond, also a distinguished physician, academic and company director with deep expertise in biotechnology. She is particularly interested in creating impact by combining disciplines and working the intersections between them. She is chair of the New South Wales Smart Sensing Network, non-executive director on several um, listed and unlisted companies and governor and council of the Queensland University of Technology. So welcome to um, both Angela and also Dr. Susan Pond. My name is Susan Pond. I'm honoured as president of the Royal Society of New South Wales to introduce Angela Moles fellow of the society and professor in the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of New South Wales. Angela was awarded the society's 2020 Pogendorf lectureship for her research in the field of large scale evolutionary ecology. The lecture has been delayed until now, of course, by the pandemic. The Pockendorf lectures are awarded periodically to recognise outstanding research in plant biology and agriculture more broadly. It was established to honour Walter Hans Pockendorf, known to his colleagues as Pog. He was a brilliant biologist and plant breeder, recognised as one of the major figures in establishing the Australian rice industry and a range of other commercial crops such as peaches, apricots, pears, almonds, grapes and rock melons. In 1928, while still very young, Pongenorf selected the first of the Pure Line rice varieties to be bred at the Yanko Rice Research Institute near Leeton. For many years, he worked as the chief of the Division of Plant Industry in the New South Wales Department of Agriculture. When he died in 1981, Pockendorf made a request to the society to establish this lecture. Angela Moles is the eighth person to receive the award. The inaugural lecturer was Donald J. Macdonald a long-time colleague of Pogendorf. Appropriately, his lecture, published in the Society's Journal and Proceedings in 1987, was devoted to Walter Pogendorf. It's a fascinating read. McDonald concludes his paper by saying, Walter Pogendorf was undoubtedly one of Australia's outstanding plant breeders that he was able to work successfully with such a wide range of crops and that his work was invariably a practical benefit to industry speaks volumes for his intellectual ability, his powers of observation, his great practical skills and above all his dedication and energy. I'm sure you'll agree that Angela Moles fellow of the Society and Professor in the School of Biological Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of New South Wales is an inspired choice for the Pogendorf Lectureship. Amongst her many roles, Angela leads the Big Ecology Lab, where she uses a combination of fieldwork and data analysis to quantify large-scale patterns in ecology. <laughs> 
Tonight, Angela will present her work on the fascinating question of are our weeds coming native species? Angela, welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present the Pogendorf lecture uh, here in the Palm House at the Botanic Gardens. I too would like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of this land. And the talk I'm gonna to give tonight is really something that I hope makes you think differently about the weeds that you see in your garden, in your nature strips, and even perhaps the weeds that you'll find in your national parks. So today, what I'm hoping to do is show you some evidence that I hope might just change the way you look at and think about some of the weeds that you find in your garden, in your nature strips, and maybe even in your national parks. Now, one of the strands that I'm gonna sort of weave through this little lecture is the fact that human uh, attitudes to things can change quite substantially through time. And so we start more than 100 years ago when people still thought that, here we go, uh, that introducing species to new rangers was a really great idea. So these blokes here with the amazing whiskers, they are what I found when I Googled acclimatization societies. And we used to have, yes, <laughs> uh, we used to have these societies working tirelessly to enrich the flora and fauna of Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the States, you know, all of the places that were being uh, colonized by Europeans. And just an example that I quite like of how whimsical what they did seems now. Um, this is an example from Central Park in New York. Now, someone from one of the acclimatization societies wanted to show off how well read they were. Um, so they decided it would be just brilliant if they could introduce every species of bird that was mentioned in the complete works of Shakespeare to Central Park. And they did. They brought them all in. Of course, some of them went extinct pretty much immediately. Some of them are still there. And one of them, the European starling, became an absolute nightmare plague. <laughs> so, as a result of the actions of the Acclimatization Society, but also lots of introductions for horticulture, agriculture, and lots of accidental introductions on people's socks and in people's pockets, uh, we now have over 3,000 species of introduced plants growing in Australia. And this has two big downsides. The first is that it costs us a lot of money. Uh, it costs Australia, this is an old number too, the estimate is that it costs Australia over $4 billion each year. And it's partly in the cost of controlling these introduced species, and it's partly in lost revenues. So for instance, we also have plagues of starlings that eat quite a lot of our grain crops, particularly in Western Australia. Now, if you talk to ecologists, so they'll focus on the second part here the enormous threat to native biodiversity. And worldwide, introduced species are acknowledged as the second biggest threat to native biodiversity, and that's second to firing up a bulldozer and driving it through your habitat, which we're also depressingly good at. Okay, so as a result of all of these good things, if you speak to most ecologists about introduced species, you pick up this subtle attitude that wouldn't seem too far astray uh, if it came from these guys. And the answer is, of course... Exterminate! <laughs> now, I'm not arguing that they're wrong, but what I want to do is give you a slightly more nuanced and complicated way of looking at these introduced species. So it turns out that in addition to causing all sorts of present day headaches, these whiskery blokes accidentally did a sort of a, a massive replicated experiment. And what they did, though they didn't know it, was inadvertently followed a near perfect recipe for creating new species. So what I'm gonna do now is just go back to biology 101 and remind you how allopatric speciation works. Start out with a population of your favorite organism. You can insert a bird or a fish or a plant or whatever you like. Um, first step is to get the population split into two or more geographically isolated subpopulations. 
And that naturally might have happened through things like sea level rise, isolating uh, low-lying islands, or mountain building events happening over a really long time. Once you've got your populations in uh, separate places, the scene is set for those populations to start adapting to the local conditions. And now you know which islands those are. Uh, these, of course, are the famous finches of the Galapagos Islands, and the young Darwin noticed that the beaks of the birds seemed uh, well matched to the different food resources that were available on those different islands. So now we've got two populations that look different, but most biologists don't consider them a new species until you go one last step and you put them together and show that they either can't or won't breed together very well. So they've established reproductive isolation. What I'm going to argue now is that this is exactly what's happened with our introduced species. So first step is to establish geographic isolation, and I think we can uh, give that a big tick. We really did that pretty well. Next thing is for them to start to adapt to the local conditions. And if you think about it, there's actually lots of reasons that you'd expect species to be under selective pressure in their new range. So here in Australia, a plant that's come in is interacting with a whole suite of different plants and animals and microbes. So it's being pollinated by different things. It's got different microbes in the soil. It's competing with a whole different suite of plants. It's having its seeds dispersed by crazy things like cassowaries. And it's being eaten by a whole different bunch of animals that it's never met before. And that's before you even start thinking about the abiotic world, right? I've often thought just how shocking it must be for a little seed that got brought over from like a music part of Britain uh, and finds itself in some of the parts of Australia. Like obviously the conditions can be very, very different. So there's lots of reasons to expect these species to be under selective pressure to adapt to life in their new land. And of course, we've got a few really nice examples of species undergoing quite rapid evolutionary change in their new lands. And one of the most famous of these is, of course, from the work by uh, Rick Schein and Ben Phillips from University of Sydney at the time. Um, and they showed that the cane toads in Australia were evolving longer legs and a tendency to hop in a straighter direction as they were expanding out across the north of Australia. So we knew it could happen, but we didn't really have much of an idea whether this was just a special case or if it was something that was happening a lot. So we started out with that question, and a lovely uh, master's student from New Zealand, Joanna Buswell, who now works for the Ministry for Environment there, and what Joanna did was asked just how common rapid evolution is in these introduced species. And she did this using herbarium specimens, and obviously there's a beautiful herbarium uh, associated with the Botanic Gardens. It's recently moved out to Mount Annan, so you have to go a little further to go visit it, but it's still worth doing. It's basically a library of pressed plants. And you can see this Plantago specimen comes from 1880, which incidentally is only about four years different to the age of this awesome glasshouse we're in. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that from that specimen, you could look at that and you can measure all sorts of things about the way that plant was growing and even reproducing. So what Joanna did was she chose species very carefully. She chose species that were sexually reproducing uh, annual or short-lived, uh, and introduced before 1920. So we wanted species that had been here through enough generations that they'd had a chance to do some evolving. We chose uh, to focus on species that had been accidentally introduced, probably, um, certainly avoiding ones that were cultivated, because we didn't want to get confounded with like artificial selection on the species. We chose species that were small enough to fit on a herbarium sheet, um, because we wanted to look at size and we didn't want the collectors to be going, ooh, that one will fit nicely on this piece of paper. Um, and, of course, we had some data quality rules about how much uh, data there should be. Um, now, putting that all together, we found 23 species uh, for which there was good enough data uh, to study. And Joanna measured plant height, leaf size, leaf shape, and leaf mass per unit area on over 1,900 specimens. Now, we knew that there were lots of reasons for them to adapt. We knew it was possible for rapid evolution to happen, but I was quite blown away. It turned out that 70% of those little weedy plants 
had actually changed significantly and substantially since arriving in Australia. So here's one of the examples. Clustered clover, Trifolium glomeratum, has become 60% shorter since it was introduced to Australia. There are also changes in other traits and other species. So Medicago lapilina, as leaf size has halved. That's quite a big difference, right? Um, Geranium mole and Lotus caniculatus, their leaves have substantially changed shape. So lots of changes, fast changes, uh, substantial changes in all sorts of directions in all sorts of different species. So having established that there were lots of changes here, Joanna, being a New Zealander, wanted to try the same thing in New Zealand. So we did. Went to New Zealand, basically used exactly the same methods, and what we found was there only 28% of the species showed significant changes since introduction. Now, I can't prove anything, but I have an idea about why this might be. Um, oh, and of course, that is significantly fewer changes than the 70% that we found in Australia. My idea is that it's about the amount of difference between where the species come from and where they've gone to. And we don't have enough studies from enough different types of environment yet to test this, but it's coming. Um, so my idea is that the species coming in from Britain are prim primarily uh, from the UK. Um, coming to New Zealand wasn't actually so shocking for them, but coming to Australia was a little <laughs> bit more of a challenge. That's my, that's my hypothesis. Okay, the next part, we thought about the clonally reproducing plants. Lots of plants go bananas on clo clonal reproduction. And we wanted to know if it was possible for them to change as well. Because this might actually be a disadvantage for these clonal species if they couldn't change after they get here. Once they, when they are first starting, asexuality can be a real benefit because you don't have to find a partner to you know, actually pollinate your flowers to, to create seeds, but it might actually hinder them in the longer term. So, uh, Rhiannon Dalrymple, who was another honours student in my lab, uh, went through, used exactly the same methods that Joanna used, but for clonal species. Um, again, she got uh, species from the same parts of the world, and she found that over half of the populations showed a significant change in at least one trait. So these clonal species, they're not being hindered by being clonal, they're changing. Half of them had undergone changes. And when we analysed it, there was no significant difference in the proportion of asexual species that were showing change and sexual species that were showing change, nor was there a difference in the rate of change. In fact, the fastest changes were actually happening in one of the clonal populations, which is crazy, right? You'd think you'd need recombination, sexual reproduction, to actually have uh, the genetic material for this to go ahead very quickly. So what's happening? Um, again, I have an untestable idea. I think that it's something fundamental about how plants grow, which is kind of really cool, but I'm not a geneticist. Um, I think it's about somatic mutation. So in an animal like myself, if I have a, a mutation in some of my somatic tissue, doesn't really make that much difference, right? I'm not going to pass that on to my offspring. In a plant, if it's got a bunch of different growing tips and there's a mutation in one of those growing tips, then every descendant cell from that cell goes on to carry that mutation. So this is kind of cool. When you look at a plant, it's actually got subtly different genotypes in the different branches, and they're competing with each other for resources and light, and they might set different amounts of seeds. And if you look at this in your garden, you'll see that different parts of the plant sometimes just die back when there's a drought or a herbivore outbreak or something. And then those parts that are working better actually just go on. So you've got kind of selection within an individual, which I find kind of fun. Um, and this whole somatic mutation can actually go quite quickly because there's all sorts of checks and balances on sexual uh, cell divisions, um, but mutation rates in just somatic cell divisions are three times higher. So there's lots of genetic variation being uh, introduced here. So this is an example from a photograph taken by Rob Lanfear from ANU, and what it shows is a bunch of eucalypts during a stick insect outbreak. And you can see some of them have got a genotype that's resistant to the herbivores, and some of them are susceptible. And this plant at the front here, it was a susceptible genotype, 
but somewhere on this lineage, there's been a mutation and all of the descendant bits. So where are the seeds going to come from? It's kind of cool, isn't it? So I reckon that might be one of the ways that these long-lived or clonal plants are actually keeping up with the changes in their environment and their rapidly evolving herbivores. Okay, next part, we sort of by now established that lots and lots of species are undergoing uh, rapid changes. The question started to be about what's the, what does a trajectory of this look like through time? And so I had a PhD student, Abaco Flores Moreno, and he went to England where the you know, records of botanical stuff go back just impressively far. And he asked whether introduced species keep on changing or if they sort of reach a new equilibrium. And I thought it would be this, right? I thought at the start of an introduction, you'd be really mismatched for your environment, um, and then you'd change quickly. But then after a while, you would have sort of found the right recipe for that place, and you'd stop changing. So to test this, we found some species that have been introduced a really long time ago, and then we asked, OK, were they still changing in the last 50 years? So the three species we looked at, Epilobium, Senecio, and Veronica, they were introduced to the UK a really long time ago. Turned out all three of those had changed since their introduction. So, you know, it's not just this part of the world that this is happening in. But what was really interesting was that two of the three of those were still showing significant change hundreds of years after their introduction. So, so far, I've shown lots of evidence for morphological change. These introduced species are changing often, they're changing fast, and they're still changing hundreds of years after arriving in a new habitat. Now, that's kind of crazy, right? It's got a couple of big implications. The first is, of course, bad news. Our introduced species are changing their morphology, presumably getting better adapted for growing in our Australian habitats. It seems likely that these species will go on to become more invasive in the future. So if you're thinking that the, uh, the weeds now are already a problem, this isn't good news. But there is some good news. And that is, I think when I started this work, we thought that rapid evolution wasn't going to be anything like fast enough to keep up with climate change and things. And what we found is that even these you know, plants can actually evolve and undergo uh, morphological change much more quickly than we thought was possible. And that has to be good news in the face of the coming global climate change. Now, the other thing that this does is it really makes you think about what we're doing in terms of conservation and uh, restoration, sort of uh, the management of our native ecosystems. Because a lot of our ways of approaching conservation are about sort of keeping or restoring uh, ecosystems in their pre-European condition. That's sort of our ideal. But in the light of all of the changes in these ecosystems that are happening in the face of climate change, we've seen species moving around really fast. We've got the species themselves evolving in situ. It's much more dynamic than a lot of our um, conservation management uh, policy actually acknowledges. So I think it's a really interesting thing to just sort of put into your mind that we are going to have to deal with dynamic species as well as a changing world. So, you know, in case conservation wasn't hard enough already. Okay, now, all of that was about morphological change. And I'm sure there's some people sitting there with their arms folded going, yeah, that's very nice, but is it evolution? Well, it turns out I can prove it, but only, cheers, <laughs> but only for one species, because this uh, actually took like pretty much a decade of work. Uh, now, the species that we focused on was Arctothica populifolia. Now, it's not one of our most rampant weeds. The thing about how really rampant weeds is they have massive home ranges, and we needed to choose something that had chose, uh, showed some change uh, since arriving in Australia, but also had a manageable home range. And this one fit the bill. Uh, it's a daisy that lives on the sand dunes of beaches. You see it all over the place when you go down the beach near sort of Aladala. It's quite pretty. So its home range is shown here. And I was on maternity leave, so I didn't get to do the cool road trip myself. This is uh, South Africa, sorry. The species was introduced to Australia in, from South Africa in the 1930s. So Robert Burtonworth uh, basically got in a car 
and drove around the entire of South Africa, sampled the populations every 50 or 100 kilometers as he went. And then uh, my friends, the geneticists, helped me a lot, and we used microsatellites to find the actual source population for this species. So we know which beach in South Africa the Australian invasion came from, which is pretty cool. Um, if you want details on the sort of stats and the methods of that, you have to talk to the awesome Bill Sherwin, because he's the person who worked it out. But the probability that it was anything other than Arniston was vanishingly small. Now, this is kind of unprecedented and really cool. It gives us um, lots of precision. So most studies, they have to sample populations across the whole source range of the population. And a lot of these species, they do. They do have ranges that are like Europe and Northern Africa, which is a lot of different climate zones. So your sensitivity to detect change is fairly low. We know which was the actual source population, and that allows us to make much more accurate measures of how much change there's really been. Uh, we used four local study populations, uh, spanning from down sort of the border with uh, Eden up to Mile Lakes. And I'm basically just going to summarize those as the Australian plants, because every one of our graphs looked a bit like this. All four Australian populations were identical, and then the South Africans would be doing something different. So I'm just going to simplify it, uh, but all of them we did test for differences. So this work was done by the awesome Claire Brandenberger, who works here uh, at the Botanic Gardens. Um, and Claire was a part-time student because she had young children at the time, and this was brilliant for us because it meant that she was in my lab for like seven years, which was so good. <laughs> um, so this gave her time to grow these things through lots of generations. And what we started with, we got the seeds from the beach in South Africa and from the beaches in New South Wales, and we grew them through one generation because sometimes the um, conditions in which those seeds matured can affect the way the baby plants grow. So we grew them through one generation to get rid of those maternal effects and to really be able to measure um, the differences between the Australian and the South African populations. And guess what? They were so different. They were different in like every morphological trait. So this is the South African plant. Uh, this is the Australian plant. Um, and honestly, they just, they differed in just about everything we measured. And most of the differences made sense in line of what we know about the differences between those two environments. So I can't prove causation here. But for instance, you can see that the Australian one has a sort of thin, creepy, cheaper stem. And they live on these sand dunes, and the winds are higher in the Australian sites than in the South African sites. And I think they have to make a cheaper, faster growing stem just to keep their leaves above those shifting sands. Now, obviously, one of the big differences here is the leaf shape. And I can't explain this one, but it's kind of cool. The juvenile leaves look like little teaspoons in both the South African and the Australian populations. But for the uh, South African ones, they have a totally different adult shape, while the Australian ones kind of keep their baby shape, but bigger into maturity, which is just weird. OK, I also had a postdoc who knew how to work uh, complicated uh, physiological equipment. So this is an infrared gas analyzer that measures how plants are photosynthesizing, and it measures what gases are going in and out. Um, so Julia uh, did this for these populations. And we kind of expected that the weed, you know, the introduced population, would be photosynthesizing faster, right? It wasn't. It was going the other way around. So the Australian ones actually photosynthesized substantially slower than the South African ones. And we think the trade-off here was with water use efficiency. So the Australian ones had way higher water use efficiency. So they lost a lot less water to fix a given amount of carbon than those South African ones. Now, that's all fine, except that the annual precipitation in the Australian sites is like twice as high as in the South African sites. So why are they so miserly with their water? Well, we didn't really know. And this bit kind of shows the value of getting back out of your greenhouse and going and validating at the field sites. So I had a very brave honours student, Steph Creer, and she travelled to South Africa and measured all sorts of things about how the plants were behaving on their home beach in Arniston. 
and how they were behaving uh, on their beaches in Australia. She had to like uh, pay a ransom to get her kidnapped field gear back at some point. She has all sorts of stuff. Um, anyway, when, we, when she got there, she sort of wrote back and said, okay, I've solved it. Because um, obviously the Arniston population, they're growing in sand, but that sand's on these rock platforms. So when it rains, even though it doesn't rain very much, the rain just puddles up and it's available to the plants. Whereas in Australia, you're just going to go through that sand forever um, and not be available to the plants. So there's a, a moral for anyone who uses uh, rainfall to think about how much water's available to their organism. It can really depend on very local things about the context. Okay, we also looked at some reproductive traits, so looking at the flower size, the inflorescence size, sorry, um, and it turns out that the South African plants were making much bigger inflorescences than the Australian plants. And again, Steph's data uh, shows why this might be. She was capturing the pollinators in these different sites, and it turned out that there were a reasonable number of insects uh, buzzing around in Arniston, but basically nothing happening in Australia. So it looks like they're you know, not getting pollinated anyway, so why bother investing in a giant flower? And instead, they've changed something dramatic about the way they make seeds. So Claire ran an experiment on uh, selfing, whether the plants could make seeds without getting pollen from an external source. Did it by basically putting these organza bags over the flowers and seeing how many seeds they made. Now for our Australian populations, they were fine. 99 of the 109 plants made heaps and heaps of seeds. The South African plants, not fine. They don't self, which is actually a really interesting difference in their reproductive strategy. And consistent with the fact that they just get on with it with their own pollen, um, the Australian plants were making way more seeds than the South Africans, which is presumably one of the things that makes them into an excellent invader. So, at this point, we've got geographic isolation for sure, and we've definitely got adaptation to the local conditions. The only remaining question is, is there reproductive isolation developing? So, Claire buzzed around in the glasshouse with a paintbrush, transferring pollen from one plant to another, um, to see what happened when we crossed them. And the first thing that became clear it was really hard to do this because they don't flower at the same time. So the South African plants don't produce their flowers until an average of almost 50 days after the Australian plants. So even if they were growing side by side on a sand dune, they wouldn't actually exchange much pollen because their flowers come out at different times. Okay, so we did persist. There was a sort of a long tail on that distribution. We are able to get some to cross anyway. Uh, and we looked at the quality of those offspring, and this was done by Casey Ch Kirchhoff, who's now more famous for her work on bushfire type stuff. Um, now, Casey found that if you'd crossed a South African plant with another South African plant, they had nearly 100% germination. If you'd crossed an Australian plant with another Australian plant, again, almost 100% germination. But if you'd mixed things up and made a hybrid between the Australians and the South Africans, only 70% viability. And that's enough of a fitness disadvantage that if you did have them side by side, even if they were exchanging pollen, they would diverge through time. So, we have this and we have temporal isolation because they're releasing, uh, they're producing their flowers at different times. We've got major changes in reproductive strategy, whether they can self or not. And we've got substantially reduced fitness in the hybrid offspring. So we're ready to call it. This is not complete reproductive isolation, but it's not for lots of other species that are out there. I would love if this audience could give us a better name than this. We are going to describe this species, and at this stage we're going with Arctothic and Nia. Um, ideas gratefully accepted. <laughs> okay, now I, I think this is a really interesting sort of a thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing, that the, the introduced species have changed so much. It's just a thing that is happening, and it's worth thinking about what the implications of this are. So what I've shown you today is that 70% of the introduced species in Australia have shown changes since they arrived. And while we've had some success in eradications of weeds on islands and in small-scale contexts, 
once something's established across the continent, it's pretty hard to get it out. We haven't actually managed it yet. So beautiful examples like the prickly pear and the cactobastus moth, they knocked it back a lot and made a great difference, but it's still here. So what I suspect will happen is that if you come back to Australia in your time machine in 100 years, 200 years, 500 years time, most of those 3,000 species of introduced plants we have, they'll still be here. And remember, they kept on changing through time. So whether they've speciated or not yet, I think it's basically inevitable that they are going to change enough that they will become reproductively isolated new species. And this is interesting because a lot of people in biology for a long time have been really concerned about biotic homogenization. The idea that we'll end up with, you know, plantagos and rats and whatever everywhere in the world and it'll all be the same. But this suggests that it's not going to be like this at all. Instead, what we've made is this wild anthropogenic adaptive radiation event. And I'm not saying that, you know, losing the koalas and willamai pines and replacing them with some new plantagos is good, but it's a thing and it's happening. Um, and it's definitely worth thinking about. And one of the really interesting questions here is, shall we still try to um, eradicate invaders if they've become unique new species? Who would, who would still try and eradicate them? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so obviously, this is a big part of our bush regeneration ethos at the moment. Um, and we get great pleasure from, you know, fighting those baddies. We feel good when we do it. It does feel great. Um, but we really need to think about this. What are we doing in the longer term? Are we actually sort of taking out the species that might become, in the long term, some of the future of Australian ecosystems? And uh, the final question for you here is, will we ever accept these introduced species as native? And uh, this was kind of interesting because it was in the introduction. Um, my son here is a second generation Australian, born in Australia, speaks with a vaguely Australian accent. Um, and, uh, you know, people readily accept him as an Australian. He has a passport. Nobody's doing that for my clover. <laughs> it's, it's been here 130 generations, grows with an Australian accent. Nobody would call it. An Australian. But what about this one? Gets really interesting here. I know there's a lot of controversy around dingoes, but they were introduced to Australia about 5,000 years ago, and the current national parks legislation does say that we have to actually try and protect the purebred dingoes. So, will we ever accept these introduced species as native? Is it just a matter of time? I think so. What do you think? <laughs> So I hope I've given you something to think about and that next time as you're looking in your garden and you're pulling out that awful Bidens that's there or something, you look at that plant differently and you think, wow, I wonder if this is evolving to life in Australia. And I'd also really like you to think about how we can do conservation in a way that really maximises the number of our amazing native species that we keep into the future rather than just sort of blindly going, we must eradicate all of the introduced species, because I think that isn't even possible anyway. Thank you. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. A um, couple of things that are on my mind is if you cross a South African with an Australian, you've probably got a great cricketer, I think. Um, anyone who can look at a 1,900 specimens and still be sane is quite an interesting one. And the interesting aspect of 70% um, versus 28%, and I don't know whether that might be because getting to New Zealand, they could have faced a... Maori haka, which could have been quite frightening. So just, um, anyway, the dingo, <laughs> the dingo is an interesting, really interesting one. Um, and if there's any politicians in the audience, we will not be killing koalas. I just don't, <laughs> don't min at that, okay? Amazing. Really, really interesting. And you've certainly um, 
Wow, you've turned a lot of things on my head and it, just in questioning and different things. So it's, I can understand why it's a complex and controversial discussion. Very interesting. Um, I've got lots of questions, but it's not my night, it's yours and it's you, the audience. So I think what I would love to do now, we do have um, microphones um, who can support on either side. And look at them, look at the hands. I knew it would happen. <laughs> I knew it, I'd never have to find questions for you. Um, so we're going to start the evening by a wonderful Q&A. I will have to unfortunately stop at some point, but um, you are going to be a wonderful and stay a little bit longer. So <laughs> this gentleman here had his hand up first. Um, and if you could, we are, I just wanted to let you know we are recording. And so um, if we can just sort of speak clearly, so when we have got the recording, people can really understand the question. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful lecture. Um, truly, that Thank was you. wonderful. <laughs> I have a very specific question. Um, with respect to the yellow flower species for which you asked us to uh, produce an alternative name, what was the insect species that was present in South Africa that was lacking in the Australian environment? It was pollinated by several things in its, um, in its South African habitat. So there's not, there's not one, it's a, it's a fairly generalist in terms of its pollinator interactions, which is fairly common, I think, for the daisies. So, yeah, no good. Uh, I should say we originally, we thought about calling it Arctotheca pulling Hansonii after, <laughs> after how much she enjoys people <laughs> immigrating to Australia and becoming Australians. But many of my co-authors just went, no, we're not honouring her. Um, and they're probably right. The, the university lawyers, I got that far, uh, said, do you really have to? <laughs> I'm hoping everybody forgets. <laughs> Thank you. There's a gentleman over here to speak. Thank you. And then there's a gentleman with the black shirt on next. And another Thank you. One really enjoyed there. your lecture. Thanks very much. Um, so the question is, does it work both ways? The, the concern, of course, of, um, about invasive species is that it takes over from the native uh, species. So is there evidence that the native species are fighting back and evolving to cope with the evolutionary pressure? induced by the invasive species? Great question. Great question, yes. Um, so we've studied whether native species up in Kosciuszko National Park are showing similar morphological ch changes. And I think we studied 28 species there. Two of them showed a change through time. So not really changing nearly so fast. And we also had a control group of native species that we compared these ones with and they weren't changing nearly so fast. So yes, there are some changes happening in the native species, but they're not nearly as fast as what's going on in the introduced species. But I think, where, I th I think we sometimes overstate the impact of particularly the plant invaders. The, the foxes and cats and things like that are clearly a massive problem. But it seems to me that the main place you get introduced species, if you go for a walk in your head, through your favourite national park, how many weeds do you actually encounter? Where they are is in the places where we've added nutrients, where we've suppressed the fire regime, where we've actually changed something quite fundamental. So like if you fertilise a patch of ground, all the banksias will die and things like that, but the weeds are like, yes, this is awesome. Um, and then we'll look at that patch that's been colonised by lantana and privet and all our usual uglies, and we'll go, oh, those weeds, they're really ruining the environment. But it, it wasn't then, it was, it was the change in the conditions that we put through. So there's a lovely example in North America where they put salt on the roads, like in Canada. Miles and miles and miles of coastal species invading. Now, of course, that's because the native species didn't really like having all that salt and they were fine with it. Um, and yet we still sort of blame the invader. So I think we need a little bit more nuance in when we attribute the blame to the invaders. And I'm not saying there aren't some dreadful ones that really do a lot of damage. But in general, they are actually where we've already messed stuff up. Mm. Great, really good question. I just thought all those invasive ones, they're the ones that I say are pretty, aren't they? Which I think they are. There's a gentleman here with the um, black shirt on. Thank you. I've uh, got you here. Fisher. Don't forget the lady in the front. <laughs> uh, way back in the mid 18th century, Carl Linnaeus had people from around the world collecting plants, thousands of them to be brought back to Uppsala for his botanic gardens, which he actually believed were built on the basis of the Garden of Eden. Uh, this was before Australia was colonised by white British people. And 
we still have 14,000 of those preserved plants. Now, Carl believed uh, that they could be retrained from the environments to which they'd adapted to adapt back. And at least he's got the collection. Uh, so I'm just suggesting that that's a pretty valuable resource and I don't know whether it's been used or whether you're planning to use it. I wasn't, but that's really a cool idea. Um, what has been suggested to me a few times is to test whether the changes I've seen in the Arctotheca are adaptive by doing a reciprocal transplant. But basically what that involves is taking a new species into South Africa or bringing another version in here, and I'm not quite sure of the ethics of that. Well, I am. I'm not going to do it. Um, but that's what you would do to prove that. Um, it would be really interesting. I suspect they'll just change in whatever direction is necessary. And that's what we've seen in lots of plant and animal taxa around the world. So the evidence for rapid evolution over the last 20 years has just skyrocketed. Thank you. I've just got the lady here in the front, and then you're next. And then Joe, I think. Um, lady here. I was just oh, keep up with hands. <laughs> I suspect that, is that working? I can hear you. Can everyone hear? No. Is it on? Yeah. Anyway, I'll speak loudly. I, I can repeat it. I suspect that what I'm going to ask about may already be happening, but I wonder if it is and to what extent are we making creative use of the knowledge and techniques you've developed to prepare for later stages of climate change. That's part one. And part two, how do we do this with genuine imagination and creativity that also allows for protecting us from a world full of cane toads. <laughs> yes. Well, it's interesting you mention the cane toads because that's one of the things that's been suggested. So Rick Schein has suggested basically training snakes with, uh, does anyone remember how this goes exactly? With like low doses of cane toad toxin so that they learn a version um, so basically he wants to parachute in cane toads ahead of the advancing front so that the native uh, animals get a chance to sort of learn to avoid that rather than getting killed. Um, and another place with uh, coral adaptation for climate change, they've been working pretty hard on trying to get some, some corals that are a little more heat wave resistant. And uh, yeah, that's going to be really important work. But in general, much of our conservation legislation is, is not dealing well with species shifting their distributions around. And it's really difficult. Like, how do you distinguish between things being allowed to move around and change and a developer completely changing the ecosystem? Like, where do you draw the line if everything is allowed to change? Mm. Um, and how, how do we... So what I think we need to do is instead of thinking we must put it back to 1788, Instead of that, because I, I think that's just increasingly untenable in the face of all of these changes, um, we need to think instead more forward and say, how do we maximise the proportion of our native species that we still have here in 100 years? And I think that would be a much more constructive thing. But it's, it's, you know, it's turning a great big ocean liner. It's very difficult to sort of whip these changes through. Yeah. Yes, but slowly. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I do this all the time uh, in my roles on the New South Wales Government Advisory Boards. Uh, I'm a board member of the uh, Saving Our Species uh, Committee. Um, and for things like the koala program, I'm like, okay, well, what about the bits to the, you know, further south that are going to become koala habitat later? You know, this sort of thing. So. People, people are putting it in um, and they're using a lot of the climate models, to, species distribution models, to try and predict what is going to happen. Um, but of course, the, the actual biological world where, you know, a species might not be in a place where the climate is suitable for it because its pollinator didn't make it or something, it's really difficult. So I, mm. I really like these sort of, these gumboot studies that I do, uh, which are based on actual observations of the species. Uh, where were they, when were they, and what were they doing at the time? Yeah. I think it's a, a really good question. There's a lot of great minds wanting to do great stuff. I don't know if policy is keeping up with it. Um, there's some great people in the audience here today, along with Angela, who can probably, you know, you've got someone sitting in the back there, Joe, particularly from a saving species. Um, it's a very good question. What are we actually doing? I do think there's a lot of great work happening. It's just how wide 
and how broad is that known and how is policy changing for it? So really, really good question. The gentleman on the jumper down the back, thank you. And I've got... Thank you. Um, yeah, terrific lecture, Angela. <laughs> um, so I, I just had a question about um, genetics. Um, you know, it seems to me that you would have a very good way of um, checking the degree of speciation through genetic studies and the genetic studies are becoming cheaper and cheaper. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is I have worked as a bush regenerator a fair bit and um, I'm quite amazed in the plant net, you know, the Botanic Gardens um, plant database that it often talks about a naturalised plant and it, you know, strikes me as strange that we talk about plants being naturalised and yet we don't have this conversation about them being accepted as a natural part um, so just wondered whether you had a comment about that too. Matt, I think you know a lot more about where the bush regenerators' <laughs> heads are than mine. Yeah. Uh, Matt was the president of the Bush Regeneration yeah, Asso was. Society for a while, what were you? No, not quite. Something. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think most of the practitioners are still at the, it's alien, let's pull it out. Um, and I got forwarded a really interesting email about a week or two ago that been something in the media or somewhere, um, and this had gone to the people at Aquis who are responsible for, you know, trying to keep these more things from coming in. And they were like, this is interesting. We're going to have to change our definitions so that we can still kill them. <laughs> <laughs> Might have paraphrased. <laughs> I think I've got this lady here. Um, jo, did you have your hand up? I'm sure you had a question. And then there's another, another person there. Hi. Um, in relation to... Um, do you, want to, do you need to have it quite close? Here. Ah, oh, beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. That's Thank it. you. Right. Um, in relation to the uh, migration of the planet, of the uh, continents, Australia migrated north slowly, so we maintained a lot more of our own vegetation and have less, more greater variation than in the northern hemisphere where there are just a lot of conifers. That's, you know, uh, <laughs> me shortening it a hell of a lot. Um, is that going to... Is that going to happen any more? Uh, is there anything else like that that is going to make a difference? Because I'm assuming whatever problems we have with invasive species, they do in America, like the casuarinas and the, and the stuff that went down the, the um, lava tunnels. Um, so is, is the rest of the world, uh, are we all going to go the same way or is there going to be variation on the theme? That's a really good question. Um, it is interesting, like what you were speaking about, about the sort of the, the historic paleontological almost, uh, like what happened with the flora of North America after the retreat of the big ice sheets and things. That's fascinating stuff. And what that tells us is that probably much of the change after, uh, in response to climate change is going to be about species physically shifting their distributions rather than adapting. And that's what those, those data show. Um, so definitely looking to the rest of the world and seeing what's happening. But just about every time we do a study where we're comparing what's happening in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, we find there is a significant difference. So yes, we need to be looking at what's happening there and where they're going, but we also really need to be getting these sorts of information for, for our own context uh, and sort of cutting our own path. But absolutely, uh, I don't know what's happening in uh, other legislations with respect to the idea mm. that new species could be evolving. There are, there are many countries, like I, I know the, the plant ecologists in Britain are still mostly very positive about the idea that people are bringing in extra biodiversity and they're really happy about how much of the biodiversity is in the garden context. So Ken Thompson's written some beautiful books on this. Um, and I remember the uh, ecologists in Sheffield, Phil Grimes' group, they were doing a study and they brought up a genotype of a plant. And this, this grass, it had only had one genotype there and it was self-incompatible, so it wasn't spreading. And they brought in another genotype. And so the thing was taking off over the hill and they're like, isn't it marvellous? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so different parts of the world are at really different places in what their cultural response to introduced species is. And I, I would say that New Zealand and Australia are actually outliers in how dramatically mm. anti-introduced species we are. Now, obviously, they do cause problems, you know, zebra mussels and introduce, you know, mm. all sorts of plants in America. Um, but we are probably on one end of the spectrum. Yeah. 
I, I think I like the idea that the reason they want them all to go in there is because they've only got conifers, which I thought was a really great explanation, and that's why they're inviting everything in, whereas we're stopping them. <laughs> um, I can only allow... I'm going to be really good. I know there's one, two, three... Oh, my God, I've got loads. I've got this lady behind here, and then Joe, and I've got the gentleman here. Oh, we're going to be here all night, and I will allow <laughs> you one more. And, and you will have to stay for a long time. I should time. have spoken for longer, so you didn't have to... I don't to want to be the main person, but someone's got to call it quits, but we will finish that one there. So... Let's go. So thank you so much. That was fantastic, Angela. Um, obviously, we're talking a lot about these cultural influences, how we actually view AIDS. So that's a whole oh, interesting thing. But I wanted to come back to the fact that, as you mentioned with the salt example or the national parks, we only mm -hmm. actually establish if we have a niche that's available for them. So I really was interested to hear whether you compared or contrasted how many species actually come in and never actually are able to establish here, uh -huh. how that compares to the 70% that actually evolved to be successful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, that's a great question. There is uh, lots of literature on this. That one of the historic sort of ideas about this is the rule of tens, that you introduce 10 species um, one of them will, is it this, this way around? Alistair, help me out. <laughs> the rule of tens, which way around does it go? To ten established or to nine? Uh, sorry, one established or nine? One. one. I, I and then the of rule. those ten, that, uh, of every ten that do establish yeah. here, one goes on to be a really big problem later. So that's, that's the rule of tens. I think there's been papers out saying uh, it's not that simple. Um, but yeah, there's, there's really interesting um, cases. I mean, things like the brush-tailed possums in New Zealand, they had to introduce those over and over and over and over again. They kept dying out. Um, and then they were a protected species until about 1940, and then they went, ooh, ooh, we got a problem. Um, so yeah, look, there's a lot of stochasticity in what succeeds. Uh, we have got evidence that there's um, selection bias, like introduction bias, of what we bring over. So people mm -hmm. saying, you know, they're really pretty, that's because we've selected pretty plants to bring over. So things like lantana, they are quite gorgeous. Um, and then, then you hate them. <laughs> yeah, so there's all sorts of things there, and I think there's a lot more work to be done there. So I think if anyone's got any... Um evidence base that they can help, we can send it through. I've got Joe, and then, was I here? But there was a gentleman at the back as well. So then I'm going to call it quits before everyone starts getting me, and we can then get... Yeah. Go, Joe. Oh, sorry. No, I I yes. Hi. Oh, sorry, Joe. Here. Me? Oh. Yeah. Hi, Angela. I love the lecture, so thank you so much. Thank you. I start with... A, on, I'm on a promise, so I know you do a lot of work with Cathy Offit here. She passed on that she, she was sorry she couldn't be here this evening. Thank you. Um, mine's around cool ideas and what we might be able to work, work together on. So I, I see that you're using traits from herbarium sheets. We've just gone through an image uh, collection, so yeah. we've got 1.1 million images. What do you see as the cool stuff we can do with that with your work? Wow. Good question, Jo. <laughs> <laughs> That's just exciting, isn't got it? Got it in there. Um, I mean, to go across these species, obviously, you know, 23 species, 18 species, whatever, these are small numbers. If we could go across all the species, we could start asking, well, which ones are going to change and when don't they change? And we could maybe use that understanding to help inform which things are going to be in trouble uh, under climate change. Uh, we might also, if we had enough information about different species changing, we could then get at that question I raised about whether species that have travelled uh, further climatically or you know, where the conditions are more different, whether they're changing the most. So we could start understanding when they're changing and how much and what context, and that would be really fun. Um, but also the native species. How yeah. much are our native species changing? Because we've changed a lot of things about their habitats. So really getting a good handle on that would be fun. And um, as you probably know, we've also been using the uh, seeds, so yeah. through Susan Everingham's uh, PhD, using some of the seeds that were banked in like the 1970s. And we've basically used those, uh, compared them to matching modern seeds, and we've found that there have been changes in our native species and that the amount that those species have changed is correlated with the amount that the climate has changed in the place they're from. And that that's particularly strongly correlated with the changes in the extremes events. So 
that's what's going to drive a lot of evolution. So, yeah, we can do so much. Yeah, we just well, need time. Well done, Joe. <laughs> and just make, making you all aware of how important our collections are. So, well done, Joe. You got that in. Um, the gentleman at the back, and then you're the very last but not least. Is that that's what we'll say? Yes, thank you. Your slide mentioned germline reproduction versus somatic reproduction. Can you define those terms, please? Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, I was just thinking of somatic uh, cell divisions as being just in the body, not associated with uh, actual sexual reproduction. So talking meiosis versus mitosis, really. Does that answer that question for you? All good? And the gentleman here. I realise now that my earlier very specific question actually implies a much more general one, which goes to the heart of the question that you posed as the title of your lecture. Um, the Australian species of insects clearly had not had sufficient time to adapt to this new introduced species. And we all of us know very well the extent to which um, Australian birds tend to neglect um, species of plant in our gardens that are from the UK, for instance. So my question is, is it not, um, I, mean, I, I, I mean, the answer to your question surely is, it's not up to us to define whether we should accept weeds as being indigenous it depends on how long it takes before the insect realm starts to accept these introduced species as being indigenous and pollinating them as, uh, yeah. in a sense, as though they were native. And so my question to you is, <laughs> is there work being done on this? And if so, can you tell us something about the results that are being obtained? Briefly, yes. Uh, so part of what you're talking about is the enemy release hypothesis, and it's one of the things that makes introduced species so successful. When they come to a new habitat, they've often left behind a lot of the specialist organisms that attacked them back at home. Now, there's a much lesser known other side of the coin to that called the missing mutualist hypothesis, which is they get here and they don't have their pollinators. Um, nobody has really... We know that about half of the time species have escaped... Um, from some of their uh, herbivores and pathogens and things, and that this is one of the things that helps species um, to do so well. We don't know which half. We don't know when it happens and when it doesn't. So my lab is working on that at the moment, but I can't tell you um, because I don't know. Um, uh, we're also looking at sort of the evidence does seem to support the idea that the pollinators do tend to be missing for a lot of these introduced species. So I wonder how many of them do tend towards sort of an asexual reproduction um, as, the, as they go. Um, but there's, there's so much to learn and we know very little about the trajectory of interactions between plants and animals through time because while we can use specimens and you know, seed bank seeds, trying to understand actual interactions through time, you need to find an old ecologist with lots of field notebooks and we haven't done that yet, though I have applied for some funding to try and do it. But. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I wish we could have lots more questions. Can you please, please put your hands together, first of all for the award and for a wonderful presentation. Fantastic. Wow, what a fantastic, um, fantastic presentation, Angela. Absolutely brilliant. Who would have thought weeds could be so exciting. Um, so please join me um, to our wonderful viewers watching. I hope you really enjoyed it. It was so, so interesting. Um, but I would love to um, for you all to thank the wonderful Angela Moles and also thank Dr. Susan Pond. I do hope you had a great time and enjoy, um, yeah, enjoy learning about weeds in the future. <laughs>